Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Summer's heat can certainly create its own set of unique problems for the garden, but it can also provide us the opportunity to spend more time outdoors and entertain, as well as usher in a season that allows certain flowers to really shine. Over the next half hour, I'll travel around the world to introduce you to useful and beautiful summer flowers designed to give your garden a splash of color. I'll share watering and mowing techniques that will help you bring your lawn through the dry conditions and heat of the season. I'll show you how to recycle garden waste into a soil builder for your flower and vegetable beds. And later, we'll look at some creative and even attractive ways to keep summer garden pests under control. Now, I know it's hot out there, but that's no reason to give up on the garden. Summer can be one of the most rewarding times of the year. So don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back to P. Allen Smith's Summer Garden Special. I try to spend as much time as I can in my garden during the summer, particularly in the early morning and evening hours. But you know, after spending so much time and effort bringing my garden along, it's always a little disheartening to see the effects of heat and the lack of rain. You see, the summer can be one of the most stressful times on plants and lawns. The damage from the heat and bright sun can take on many forms. Everything from parched, crusty brown grass to scalded leaves to weaken plants that are easily attacked by opportunistic pests. Consistent watering is an effective solution. So how about some tips that can make your life easier and refresh your plants and lawns? I've always found it helpful to deep soak my lawn in flower beds. This encourages deeper root growth and makes plants better able to withstand periods of drought. Also, watering in the early morning will give grass and other plants a chance to dry before nightfall, and this can help cut down on problems with disease. And if you're like me and have a tough time remembering to water, try attaching an inexpensive water timer to your hose and sprinkler. If you don't have an automated system, this can be an easy solution. It has been said that Americans are obsessed with their lawns. Believe it or not, we mow an area each year the size of the state of Pennsylvania. Now that's a lot of grass. But to keep your lawn in top shape can be a challenge. So here are a few tips that can help you get through the season. First, always make sure that the blade on your mower is sharp. This can be done with a file or by a professional at the mower repair shop. Also, it's best to keep the length of the grass high, about two to two and a half inches. This helps retain moisture because the blades shade the roots. If it is cut too short, you'll stress the grass, which will invite problems with disease. Of course, the grass clippings themselves are worth their weight in gold. So bag them as you mow or rake them up and put them in the compost bin. Before you know it, you can recycle them back into your flower beds as a rich homemade source of humus. When I was growing up, I was constantly reminded by my grandparents and parents of the importance of saving and reusing things. And those are some of the same voices I remember when I add material to my compost bin. Composting is such an efficient form of recycling. I'm always adding to my bins, whether it's scraps from the kitchen or clippings from the garden. And in no time, you can produce this, an excellent enhancer for your soil. If you've priced bag soil conditioners lately, you know that making your own can be quite a savings. I find myself applying this a couple of times a year in my raised vegetable beds because I always have a variety of things growing in them. With many of my early spring crops finished, I'm ready for the next round. First, I'm going to give the soil a little boost with some of this compost. And I've found that a wheelbarrow load like this will cover about a six by six area. That works out to about three to four pounds per square foot. I just spread it out evenly and then turn it over with a fork, incorporating it into my existing soil. While there's certainly nutrient in my compost, I don't rely on it solely for fertilization. 
I mainly use it in these beds to help improve the texture of my soil so it'll fall apart like this when I squeeze it. Compost can improve just about any kind of soil, whether it's clay or sand based. For sand, it helps it hold moisture better. And for clay, it helps break up those tightly compacted particles. This is one of the best forms of recycling I know because the payoff is always in a great bounty of fruit and vegetables. Summer flowers from around the world, pest control tips, and more when P. Allen Smith's Summer Garden Special returns. Welcome back to P. Allen Smith's Summer Garden Special. You probably wouldn't think that I'd have to travel halfway around the globe to get a closer look at some of our North American native wildflowers, the kind we see growing along roadsides and in meadows. But here I am at the Kulkenhof Gardens in Holland. While this garden may be best known for its spring displays, what you can see here in the summer is nothing short of spectacular. This is this country's most famous and premier display garden, where I've discovered some familiar faces from back home. Now let's go back to my garden and take a closer look at some Native American plants that I grow, starting with these purple cone flowers. They grow wild in fields and along the roadsides in many parts of the country. And of course, you can just about always find them in gardens these days because they're such super perennials. Just look at these blooms. It's amazing how bright and fresh they look even in the hot summer sun. These make excellent cut flowers and I often use them in arrangements. There's a lot more to this plant than just a pretty face. You can find it in almost any health food store, but not as purple cone flower and not in this showy form. You see, its other name, botanical name, is echinacea. And if taken in pill form, it can actually boost the immune system. I know this isn't the cold and flu season, but there's nothing nastier than a summer cold. What's amazing about these beautiful garden flowers is that they can actually reduce the symptoms of a cold and cut down on its duration. The active ingredient is extracted from the root of cone flower, and it's freeze dried to help preserve some of its potency before it's put into pill form. Now, echinacea isn't regarded as a cure for any particular problem. It's just a way to help bolster the body's immune system to get it ready to fight. And that's the reason it's best to take it at the onset of the symptoms of cold or flu. There's much more about Native American plants on my website. That's pallensmith.com. Is it any wonder why these are called sunflowers? Few names are as fitting. The bloom actually looks like a little miniature sun. And as you might guess, for these little guys to perform well, they need full hot sun. You can't get much more American than these. They're natives that have been hybridized into some astonishing giants. Some of them can produce flower heads at least 12 inches across. And then there are others that perhaps don't grow as large but make up for it with a beautiful array of colors. In the past, I've planted the big guys, but since my vegetable garden is small, they tend to overpower it. So this year, I planted this little dwarf variety called Sunspot. The scale of them seems to fit better, and when you mass them in a raised bed like I've done here, they can be quite a splash of color. I planted these from seed about six to eight weeks ago. I just planted four rows of them, spacing the seed a couple of inches apart. These are some of the showiest annuals you can grow, and since they're up and blooming so quickly, it's a good way to get children excited about gardening. And when the seed heads dry, they're a favorite of birds. I'm cutting a few of these blooms before they get too mature, so I can dry them. There's really nothing to it. Just cut as long a stem as you can and hang them upside down in a dry, well-ventilated place. They're ideal for using for fall arrangements. late season color from south of the border and making outdoor entertaining a pleasure when P. Allen Smith's Summer Garden Special returns. Welcome back to P. Allen Smith's Summer Garden Special. There always seems to be something going on in the garden to dazzle us, even late in the season. A good example of this is the dahlia. 
Just look at all of these robust blooms and the festive colors. They can range in height from dwarfs only 15 inches tall to the giants that can reach six feet or more. Like the marigolds, dahlias came into our gardens from their native Mexico. To produce outstanding blossoms such as these, you want to make sure you give them plenty of sun. One of the things I like about dahlias is they're not fussy about soil. Any average garden soil will do. When you fertilize, you want to make sure you don't give them too much nitrogen. You see, this will cause them to produce fewer blooms and soft, weak stems. If you live in a part of the country where cold winters and hard frosts are the rule, it's important to lift dahlia tubers or the roots from the ground and store them. I like to dig them at least with a one foot diameter root ball, lift soil and all and put them in a cool, dark, dry place, and then cover them with dry sand or sawdust until I'm ready to replant them in the spring. In mild climates, dahlias are regarded as perennials and can be left in the ground through the winter by simply mulching the plants after you've cut them back in the fall. The way I see it, these flowers are worth any extra trouble you may have to go through to keep them from one year to the next. And another great thing about dahlias, they make good long-lasting cut flowers. And as you can imagine, with this kind of color, they can make a bold splash in the garden. While in Holland, I was able to see these tubers grown on a massive scale. Here we see a process that may seem a little hard to understand at first glance. This machine is actually lopping off the flower heads, leaving behind the bare foliage and stems. You see, growers do this because this allows the plant to focus its energy on the root system rather than on the blooms. So when it comes time to harvest and ship the dahlias, they'll be more robust, which means better plants for our gardens. When the summer heat rolls in and there's no relief in the forecast, we can always find relief in a cool shady spot. But what about the plants in our gardens, and particularly those growing in containers? The summer heat can be even more oppressive on them. But the sun does have its advantages. The warmth can bring forth wave after wave of bloom all summer long, if you take care of your plants properly. Let me give you an example. This dahlia is already on its second wave of bloom. After the first stalk emerged and flowered, I just cut it back, and now it's ready to bloom again. Now I'm going to do the same with this moss verbena. I'm just going to clip off the spent flower heads. You see, by doing this, in just a few weeks, I'll have even more blooms. Of course, happy plants are well-fed plants, and I recommend feeding frequently, about every two weeks with an all-purpose liquid fertilizer. You see, since we have to water so frequently in the summer, you leach out nutrients, so it's important to keep them well fed. And I've found that using a saucer under a container, no matter the size, is one of the best ways to help keep the soil consistently moist. Now, as an added touch, I'm going to put in just a few of these begonias to give the container a sparkle right up until the first cold days of fall. Now, if you'd like more tips on container planting, just check out our website, pallensmith.com. How to keep summer pests from ruining your next outdoor party when P. Allen Smith's Summer Garden Special returns. Welcome back to P. Allen Smith's Summer Garden Special. Ask anyone who's into cooking what their favorite herb is, and no doubt garlic will get a lot of votes, but right up at the top will be this plant, basil. Last year I planted my basil on the other side of the vegetable garden, and this year I'm going to put them in this raised bed. I like to move my vegetables and herbs around from year to year. It helps me stay one step ahead of the pests. I also like mixing basil with other vegetables, like these peppers, and I've planted a purple leaf variety along with some eggplant. I'm planting several varieties. This is the tall sweet basil. It'll produce lots of leaves that I can use in cooking. I'm also planting this one called spicy globe, which makes a small mound, great for a border. And these purple varieties are excellent for accenting other plants, particularly in containers. You'll find this versatile and flavorful summer herb one of the easiest you can grow. They like plenty of sun and warm temperatures. Each year when I'm planning my summer vegetable garden, I try to keep two things in mind. First, always choose plants that can take the heat. 
like tomatoes and basil. And then choose plants that have lots of visual interest, whether it's flowers or plants that produce interesting produce, like these ornamental peppers. This variety is called Medusa, and I like it for its showy fruit set. Over the years, I've developed quite an appreciation for peppers. Now, when it comes to eating them, personally, I go for the sweet varieties. But I've found an application for hot peppers that helps me get rid of pests in my garden. You can actually use a hot pepper wax spray that'll keep pests on the run. This product combines paraffin wax and other ingredients with capsaicin the chemical naturally found in peppers that makes them hot. When sprayed directly on a plant's foliage, the wax lightly coats it and holds the hot spray in place. I found this to be an effective and organic way dealing with certain pests in the garden, like leaf hoppers, spider mites, and white flies, just to name a few. Now, when you use this, you need to certainly keep it away from children, and you don't want to get any of it in your eyes because it can really burn. But don't be afraid to spray it directly on the produce in your garden. You see it washes off with just a little warm water. One of the ironies of gardening is that often some of the smallest pests can create the biggest nuisance. Let me give you an example. I know this little angel's trumpet doesn't look like much now. It's because it's just getting over an infestation of white flies. But if you could have seen it last year, it was spectacular. It was covered with these long, peach-colored, trumpet-shaped blossoms, and the foliage was a rich green. As you can see, the white flies have just about drained all of the life out of this little plant. You can see the evidence of their damage in the lack of vigor in the plant and the discoloration of the leaves. Before, they were a rich green, and now they've turned the sickly yellow. You can tell that you have white flies by doing a simple test. Just shake the foliage, and if a cloud of white insects fly out, then you've spotted the culprit. I was able to get this infestation of white fly under control with repeated applications of an insecticidal soap. Now, for this to work best, you'd really need to soak the underside of the leaves and the top of the plant all the way down to the base. My second line of defense is to use these sticky white fly traps. You see, the color yellow is attractive to white flies and other insects. So they're drawn onto it, stick, and eventually die. If you'd like more information on earth-friendly and safe ways to deal with pests in your garden, log on to my website, pallensmith.com. The summer is that time of year for me to kick back, slow down a bit, and enjoy all of the hard work I've put into my garden. One of my favorite ways to do this is to bring the dining experience outdoors. To do this, you have to be willing to deal with some challenges, the weather being one, and of course, insects. Now, there's not much I can do about the weather, but when it comes to dealing with some of those unwanted guests, the bugs, I do have a safe and pleasant defense, and that's citronella. Citronella is an aromatic oil that's derived from a tropical grass, which is a close cousin to the same lemongrass that's so popular in oriental foods. As an oil, it's long been prized for its fragrance and insect-repelling qualities. Now, you can use this oil by burning it in torches like this. When lit, the atmosphere they create is perfect for outdoor dining and entertaining. You can also use these citronella candles. They come in a variety of sizes and containers. This one is put in a galvanized bucket for placing in the garden. The candle wax has been blended with the same oil used in the torches. And you have to admit, these votive citronella candles make an enchanting addition to the dinner table. A great companion to P. Allen Smith Gardens is our website, pallensmith.com. Log on to learn more about today's topic. You'll also get hands-on gardening tips, design ideas, lessons in garden history, delicious recipes, and crafts projects that will take you from season to season, all beautifully illustrated with thousands of colorful images that will inspire your creativity. Plus, don't miss Alan's free weekly newsletter delivered straight to your inbox, all just a mouse click away at pallensmith.com. These citronella torches have been a lifesaver for me on warm summer evenings when I've had guests in the garden. You know, the whole point of having a garden is being able to go out and enjoy it. I hope some of the tips that I've shared with you in today's show will enhance your enjoyment of the season. And I certainly hope you'll try some of the plants I mentioned. 
here's hoping that the living is easy during the summertime for you in your garden. From the garden, I'm Alan Smith. garden I dream of a bed of flowers bluebirds sing of the beauty all around us and every time the sun comes out I can't help but smile oh But smile 